Hey, fellas, does the name Major General Baron Friedrich von Steuben mean anything to you? It's that too long to get music? tattooed. That's that's one thing. Yeah, right across the back between the shoulder blades. <laughs> Does it go around? It'd have to go under the arm. It's, it, you'd probably have to maybe maybe around the neck as well. <sighs> that um, was my well, nickname in high school, actually. <laughs> okay. I bet they called you Baron for short. Or Stube. B Ron. That was it. Friedrich Stube. Stube. Well, um, this guy was hired by none other than George Washington to build and train America's army during the Revolutionary War. In the 18th century, there wasn't really a language for being out or gay, per se, but um, using our modern terms, evidence supports that General von Steuben was indeed gay. Historians believe Washington knew he was gay, too, but he also believed that von Steuben's private life was not relevant to his military career whatsoever. Ain't that the truth? And very modern of you, Mr. Washington. At any rate, here's a little factoid to ponder for you guys. Uh, homosexuality was punishable by death in all 13 of our United States when Congress later threatened to withdraw Barron's pay pension because of his lifestyle choices. Washington stepped up, wrote a letter defending General Barron, saying in part, quote, I wish to make use of the last moment of my public life to signify in the strongest terms my entire approbation of your conduct, end quote, which is fancy talk for, quote, in my words, I support you no matter what, end quote. But perhaps von Steuben's rank and privilege shielded him from being drummed out of the army like other gay men of lesser rank, but regardless, he was and still is an American hero and may be, in fact, America's first openly gay flag officer. Let's get this show started. This is the Tango Alpha Lima podcast. They call me crazy because I'm facing all my giants. They try to scare me into thinking I can't fight it. They tell me I should never even think of trying. But that's just me. I'm going to live out in defiance. Welcome, Alphas. Thank you for joining us. We have a fantastic show for you today. Our guest is retired U.S. Army Major General Tammy Smith. General Smith served 35 years, which included before, during, and after the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. So after the repeal, Tammy re-enlisted with her partner by her side. They married, and Tammy became the first openly gay flag officer in Army history. We'll talk with General Smith about her advocacy on behalf of the LGBTQ plus community and military veteran communities as well. But first, today, June 25th, is the anniversary of the start of the Korean War. Yep, June 25th does mark the 74th anniversary to the start of the Korean War. In honor of that, guys, I wanted to share one of the stories of a veteran I met while on my journey with the Veterans Portrait Project. As you know, I traveled to all 50 states and I met all kinds of folks. One of them really stood out to me and I was in Laverne, Minnesota and this elderly gentleman by the name of Arvin Vernon Tilstra sat in my chair and he was just bubbling with energy. The guy had more energy than me, if I'm being really frank, but he was like, Hey, uh, so how long is this portrait going to take? I need to get back in the combine and help my son, uh, bring the corn in. I was like, yeah, it makes sense. Well, anyway, uh, Arvin was born uh, uh, in October 20, October 23rd, 1930, <clears throat> excuse me, on a farm in Rock Rapids, Iowa. He attended school in Iowa and also Minnesota. Uh, he eventually moved to Steen, where he helped his father on the farm there before he was drafted into the army for the Korean conflict as a combat engineer. Now, Arvin went to Korea. He, the conflict, as you know, was rough. And a lot of his unit was decimated. Arvin told me that the combat was so bad that he was one of the last guys to survive from his unit. Now, he was sent home to Minnesota. Uh, and he said it took like two days to get from Korea all the way back to Minnesota. He landed in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I think he said it was like one in the morning. Got, I think he said he hitchhiked or he got a ride from some random stranger back to Minnesota. And uh, arrived there in town around 3 a.m. He said he took a 
quick nap, got a bite, and was on the tractor back on the farm by 5 a.m. I think Arvin, uh, as I said back then when I photographed you, you're my hero. You're the best. Um, I absolutely love you and thank you for your service. And Arvin has since passed away at the age of 93. But if I could give a shout out to Arvin in heaven, thank you so much for allowing me to join you in the combine after we wrapped up our portrait session. I will never forget uh, taking in the corn in Minnesota with you and hearing your story. Now, if you've not seen the Korean War Memorial in Washington, D.C., I want to take a minute to tell you a little bit about it because it's really important. My great uncle, Robert Pearsall, is a Korean War veteran, was. He's also deceased, but um, I went to the memorial and it meant a lot. Um, our super producer, Holly, gave this really, really beautiful description. So I'm just going to take a minute. Uh, there are 19 statuettes of soldiers marching through what looks like a rice field. And these are the proportions to the number of U.S. Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines who served in the Korean War. Now, the number 38 is important to the design, to the memorial, because the 38th parallel and 38 months of fighting between 1950 and 1953, the 19 statues are reflected in the mural of the wall, which also doubles the figures to become, get this, 38 figures. So the statuettes are, the statuettes are made of stainless steel because of their reflective properties. This is the difference from most statuettes on the National Mall, which are made from granite or bronze. The Korean Mo Memorial is the first stainless steel memorial ever erected in Washington, D.C. Black granite is what is made of the mural wall, which is wonderful because it's etched. And of course, being a photographer, I appreciate this the most with 2,500 images of individuals who provided supply, medical, spiritual, and fire support to the frontline units. When viewed from afar, the wavy images evoke mountainous ranges from Korea. If you closely scrutinize these pictures, you might be able to spot a single canine depicted in the mural, a soldier with his German shepherd. Quite extraordinary. Uh -huh. And I think this definitely amplifies uh, this forgotten war and yeah. these heroes that went for so long unsung. Yeah, Stacey, I just wanted to acknowledge Arvin and, and your uh, great uncle Robert as well. And uh, my grandfather, Richard Hampton, uh, was a Marine awarded the Purple Heart in Korea. And uh, he, he came back home and, and, and lost his life in a, in a car accident when my mom was just the age of seven. So he, he fought and, and served and, and made it home and never had the, the chance to, uh, to meet him. So I'd like to give him recognition here today. The, that whole thing is beautiful. If, if any of you ever get a chance to go out there and see it, please do. It's just, it's gorgeous. It's all inspiring. Okay, Alphas, please stick around. Stacy and Joe will be back with General Tammy Smith right after the break. And I'll be back after the discussion to join the crew for some scuttlebutt. Did you know that over 36% of veterans experience migraines? If you're among them, you're not alone. And there is a drug-free solution that can help. Meet GammaCore, a non-invasive vagus nerve stimulator designed to prevent and treat your headache pain. It's small, portable, and easy to use. It works by gently stimulating the vagus nerve to reduce pain and can be seamlessly integrated with other medications or treatments you may already be using. You deserve relief and control over your migraines. To get started with GammaCore, call your VA provider or use the My Health Vet portal to schedule an appointment today. Welcome back, Alphas. And uh, today we're joined with General Smith. Welcome to the show. It's good to be here, thanks. Well, um, I'm going to call you Tammy. Is that okay? That's perfect. Cool. Uh, I'm so thrilled that we get to chat. Most of the alphas don't know, but uh, you and I know each other. Uh, I've had the luxury, uh, the honor of of talking with you uh, in a previous interview. So um, I'm so thrilled that now you get to chat with Joe, but not before I get to ask the first question. So, um, how's your wife? How's Tracy? Tracy's doing great. Thanks for asking. Of course. We've, uh, we've uh, recently relocated in our last PCS in a sense, and um, we're still getting settled in a bit. Yeah. Well, we'll have to like, definitely get into that. Um, but, you know, because I know your story, I don't think it would be fair to the alphas listening if we don't kind of dive into that first. 
Um, so if you don't mind, can you give us a little bit of a, a cliff's notes of, uh, your story, how you got into the military and, uh, your journey to becoming, um, a flag officer? I'll, I'll cram 35 years here yes. into the next minute or so. <laughs> the, uh, you know, I, I came into the army a little accidentally. It was in the, uh, 81 is when I graduated high school. And all I knew is I wanted to get out of my small town of Oakland, Oregon. And I just thought the way to do that was college. And I didn't come from a family that had college money laying around. So, you know, if I was going to do that, I was going to have to figure it out myself. And that figuring it out came out one day in my Future Farmers of America magazine. And um, I was reading that. I was a member, loved it. Um, there's a little flyer in there. It said, no money for college. Let the Army show you how. Send for free information. And that free information was a four-year ROTC scholarship application. And so I thought, boy, if they'll pay for my college, I'll go into the Army. I've got no problem with that. And, and that's really how I stumbled into it. But what happened after I arrived in the Army is that I just loved it because I just loved the values. I loved the people. I loved like we had this sense of purpose and mission that was the same, no matter like who you were hanging out with. And all of those things made me like it. And so my original thought of going to the army, getting out of Oakland, Oregon, um, doing my time and getting out, you know, ended up through a numerous assignments and zigs and zags and in my career, um, ending up being 35 years and culminating then having had the just the absolute privilege to serve as a flag officer for nearly uh, 10 years at the end of my career. Which is incredible. I mean, gosh, I, I can't imagine. I have to look it up. I'm, I'm terrible at um, military history specifically. <laughs> like how, how many flag officers there have been in military history? I can't imagine a lot. That, that tip of the spear is pretty narrow. So the pyramid is pretty tight there uh, at, at the top of it. And, and, even when you look at the number of women who are being promoted, um, yeah. remember my my class I, I commissioned in 1986. So I was like the remainder of the women who had joined in 1986, which was an entirely different environment, of course, which yeah. I'm glad of, of many of the women who have the opportunity to join today. Yeah, I mean, I think about it. When I came in, only of the entire DOD, I think it was 12% women that's and that's being generous i think by the time i got out it had risen to 15 percent. i do wonder like what the military percentage of women was in 86 probably you know if you kind of back that out i'm thinking it's going to be in a single digit yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) so but you know i didn't really think that much about it being different i mean it showed up in my ffa magazine it must have been for me you know, I, I look back on it now and I realize that they were looking probably for some farm boys um, to, to send in for that free information. But, you know, at the time, you know, you own the world when you're young. And I walked into that ROTC scholarship having no idea that we had just graduated women from West Point, that the Women's Army Corps had only disbanded in 1978, just a few years before that. We were an entirely separate army. All of these things had already happened. And man, I walked in like I owned the place. You know, As you it, should. it's funny you mentioned, you know, I, first of all, I love that you said you own the world when you're young. Um, we we do fostering and we've done so much reading on on babies. And, and I've read so many articles that talk about how babies, almost all babies are geniuses. Mm-hmm. But there's something that happens. And if you think back, most of what we lost as we matured, which we all, me, I needed to do, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but we, I lost a lot of the really great stuff about being young too. And I feel like, you know, as a, in your story, you know, you, you know, first of all, thank you so much for taking time to hang out with us today. You rock. Okay. I, I, it means the world to me to be able to spend time talking with you. But, you know, when you navigate that initial period of your, of your public coming out, you know, what were the the sort of the key moments or support systems that helped you balance your personal authenticity and your professional responsibilities, because all of a sudden you're kind of, I'm kind of an icon in a way, but you still have work to do. And, you know, so how do you balance that? And what was your support system like for that? Yeah. And I, and I guess I just kind of skipped over that part of the story. Um, The, uh, but one of the things that happened with me is so soon after going to college and, and, uh, 
just in a new environment and thing, you know, I discovered things about myself that many young people do. And the thing that I learned about myself that I, it was that I was attracted to women and not to men. And, um, but, but I knew I couldn't keep my scholarship if uh, that was something that I became open about. So while I certainly lived my life um, authentically as me, I did it top secret. I mean, I hid my life from my coworkers, from my peers. And I did that for 25 years. I was under a policy or a law that said my being identified as homosexual or lesbian um, was just on face value, a, an affront to military service. And that if people knew about me, then I would be discharged. And I spent 25 years in that setting. And so that sets up like how I made that transition because I learned how to hide. And my leadership was built around this core of covering myself, of pretending that I had a separate life. I kept these little compartments and I moved from compartment to compartment, but they didn't cross over. And so when I hit this timeline of what is kind of like my public coming out and where the iconic part of this comes in is that there had been lots of people working on my behalf while I was serving um, to repeal this law that was known as Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And, and thankfully, um, that all came to be. And this was in about 2011. So September 20th, 2011, I was in Afghanistan at the time. And I remember on the day that it was finally gonna take place, I just woke up and just felt like the weight of the world had been lifted off my shoulders. But I, you know, it's not like I came out to anybody. I didn't tell anybody. I just felt safer on that day. And then I redeployed from Afghanistan in late 2011. In 2012, Tracy and I had the opportunity because I was home and I can't get kicked out anymore. So we went ahead and, and we were married in Washington, D.C. in March of um, 2012. And then a couple months later, I got notified by the Army that I had been selected for promotion to Brigadier General. And so, you know, she and I and, you know, perhaps our peers in the community kind of had this decision to make is like, are we going to be who we are? I mean, she's married. We're married. Um, am I going to just like pretend like um, she's just someone that's I'm close to at our promotion ceremony? And, and what we decided is that this was a leader responsibility to have an authentic life, to model an authentic life. And even though we had no idea like what was going to happen or what the blowback was going to be, we decided together that if we weren't role modeling, that we were a married couple. Now, even though Defense of Marriage Act was still in place and there it wasn't any recognition of Tracy as my spouse, but we just felt like if we couldn't do that, like what hope does a sergeant have? You know, um, wow. in, if a brigadier general can't come to a place and say, um, I'm here with my wife. Um, there's, you know, what are what are we going to do across the rest of the force? And and we just we were just in this moment where you know the universe caused me to cross paths in this way with this situation, and um, you know we decided to do it. But I'm going to say that it wasn't easy <laughs> to make that transition because I was so muscle memory conditioned to hide in my compartment. Yeah. That I actually had to learn how to be out, even though, I mean, like everybody in the army knew I was out because it made the news. Yeah. yeah. It, I, it, so, you know, from the ground side of things, nobody on the ground, like the people that, trying to think of the best way to put this, nobody I knew cared. And I don't mean that as an undermine the struggle. I mean, as in like, I just want somebody that's going to have my back and that's all that matters to me. And I don't care if, you know, who they are, or what they do on their personal time. It doesn't bother me one bit. Having said that, you're exactly right. When you made that point, the decision, if you don't show that you trust the system and you're not willing to, to lead from where you were, um, then that's, that's, that means a lot that it, it, you, you know, to show that you're willing to, to step up and, 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 you know, share your life, uh, not necessarily publicly, but to be open with it and be authentic. And I love that you glossed over that part of your career. 
And, and I think it's funny because, so I was injured in Iraq in 2004. I lost my left leg above the knee. My right leg is jacked up. And then in my dreams, I have two legs because that's not how I see myself. The most important thing to me is not the most important thing to other people. And so, you know, I'm sure sometimes there's a struggle to that, that you're a general first, you're a human being first, you're, a, you know, an army flag officer, like that's who you are. And these other things are, are substantive of that. And so, you know, it, whenever people gloss over things that other people might think is the, the, the big, the big thing, the big <laughs> point, it's uh, it, that's, that's great. Cause that means that you don't have your identity set in this one thing. I, I just, you know, I just wanted to acknowledge that, that there's nothing wrong with glossing over something because, you know, like I, I rarely, you know, I don't bring my stuff up and people forget and they ask me to do things that I can't do. I'm like, I can't do an eight mile, <laughs> an eight mile hike, <laughs> but thanks for offering. It doesn't yeah. hurt my feelings. It makes me feel good that people think that I can yeah. do those things. Yeah. Well, in, in my dreams, Joe, I'm 1% body fat, so. <laughs> That's rough. <laughs> I don't, I don't even think I'd want to dream that. That's uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, early on about this, this glossing over it, it. And this is that, that learning to navigate and bring those compartments that were separate a little closer together so that the compartment now is just me. And I can remember just so clearly that um, early in this process about my decision that I was going to have Tracy do the promotion and that was going to be how I signaled who I was. Um, a public affairs officer who was helping me prepare for what would be the media response to this said to me, he goes, well, you know, you're going to have to decide right now, are you going to be the general or the gay general? Because, because neither one of us really just had the experience to understand that I really didn't have to choose between those two things. I was going to say, it, it, it seems to me that that's one of the silliest things I've ever heard because you were, you are who you are. It's not yeah. going to spontaneously change because you do it in public. It's yeah. not going to change your character or your identity. That seems ludicrous to me. Yeah. Well, you know, at the time, because, you know, I've lived my life in the closet all this time. Yeah. And here I'm going to come out to the very institution that said I had to be in the closet. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, it, it scared me when he said that, because I thought, oh my God, I, I am going to have to choose. And, but I'm a soldier first. And, right. um, but how do I, you know, I didn't know that I didn't really have to choose between those two things. And Tracy and I, we approached it kind of with the phrase that we, we decided for ourselves was that um, we are a military family that happens to be gay, not a gay family that happens to be military, that, that we just chose to lead with that military identity. And and Stacey, to your point, is it just, it, you know, the character of who you are is in the end, that is what people will see. Yeah. So a lot is happening around our country and, um, you know, everything ebbs and flows and changes and our military has evolved. And as you were talking, actually in the most recent years for women, yeah. um, for the LGBTQ plus community, uh, I was wondering, okay, let me give you a little backstory. I'm at the car wash of all places. And I go into the, the little waiting area while my car is being detailed. Cause I don't do that myself, by the way. Uh, anyway, there's, um, a, a gal over here, a gal on my left and a gal on my right. And they start talking politics. And of course I'm shrinking back. Uh, cause I definitely don't want to get in the crossfire of that, um, uh, but one one person, you know, they were kind of debating the uh, abortion and I shrank a back a little further. And then they were talking about um, gay rights. And I was like, and then I sat up a little bit and I started listening. I'm like, OK. One gal was talking about, <clears throat> um, you know, each state has the ability to pass laws that could restrict or inhibit the LGBTQ plus community. And it's, you know, peop Americans' rights to move to whichever state best reflects who they are. Um, and that, and, and, I, and I'm like, I can appreciate where, where that person was coming from. I stepped in and I was like, you know, when people volunteer for the military, we have no control over where we go. Mm -hmm. So to me, we have to be respectful of the people who volunteered their lives at the altar of freedom. And that includes everyone. 
mm-hmm. even the LGBTQ plus community. So as a as a leader, mm-hmm. what kind of recommendations would you perhaps give to communities or, or military who find themselves living in states with those kind of restrictions? And you, you know, you've navigated some of that. What kind of tips or thoughts mm-hmm. might you give? Yeah, there, boy, there's there's really two halves to that. There's the policy piece and there's the lived experience piece. And, um, you know, approaching it first from a policy perspective, you're, the, your car wash folks were right. You know, you can live in any state you want, but as you pointed out, that's not true for the military because if you have to go to Florida or Texas or one of these states that is is making the choice to be more restrictive, then then you just have to go. And for the people and actually the potential recruits and and such who live in in those states is that that mobility that they talked about about moving to any state you know that comes from economic freedom too and many of the members of this group are are often underemployed um, because they are discriminated against because of their identity and so i think that policy side is that i think it's really important for people who have an understanding of it people like me, people like podcasts like this, is that they explain to people some of these barriers and hardships um, that will face some of our service members um, through no fault of their own, just doing their duty. And of course, we do focus on the service member who might have barriers um, and face discrimination that they hadn't faced um, previously. But it, but it also, um, it may not impact the service member at all, but it may impact their children as they move into a, one of these places. And, and they've lost a, a certain parental rights to make certain decisions about how they're gonna raise their children. And, uh, and that's another part of it. So that's the policy piece that we've got to make sure that um, decision makers just have an understanding of it. It isn't. It doesn't affect just those other people that boogeyman. It affects our service members and many times in our families. In on the other side of that, I think it's really important for the armed services to take responsibility to educate military members who are going to be moving to those states. Through you know, they you got to go to the Sergeant Major Academy. I mean, it's in Texas. You just got to go. Um, to, to help them understand what the lay of the land is um, and what some of these barriers are and what their legal rights and protections are as a m- member of the military. And there's also many advocacy organizations out there who pride themselves or who exist to be um, subject matter experts in this, like the Modern Military Association of America, American Veterans for Equal Rights, some of these other organizations that are out there. But I don't think that the military service can outsource that to advocacy organizations. I mean, our HR professionals and our leaders really need to step out and and gain their own understanding of some of these barriers that exist because this is gonna impact their soldiers and their soldiers' families. And in the end, that impacts readiness. Yeah, I think I would um, ask for a follow-on question in that, you know, there are American Legion posts across the Mm -hmm. US. And so if there are uh, legionnaires who are interested in learning about the LGBTQ or the veterans in their community, what kind of resources can they look to? You know, there are many organizations that are looking to do this intersectional approach. Because for me, the thing about the veterans community and the LGBTQ community is that unlike many of the other communities, it's, they come from everywhere. Then they come from big towns, little towns, they're every color, they're, you know, they're every socioeconomic background. You, they come from all over and they're actually a community that is much more alike than they are different. And so I think that there is huge opportunity for collaboration from organizations like the American Legion to go and reach out perhaps to uh, P flag parents and friends of lesbian and gays and and their core mission is to ensure that parents have a um, understanding of what their children are going through as they identify um, and find out who they are going through. But I think that there are many opportunities at each of the state levels to intersect these organizations and the 
and the bulk of them, 99% are nonpartisan when you're looking at those organizations that that are there to advocate for LGBTQ people, because again, we, they, we come from all populations, so you can't be partisan about this, but I think there is huge opportunity. And because so many of these are state-driven and local, even though they may have a national umbrella, they're gonna speak the language of Alabama. They're gonna speak the language of Oregon. They're gonna speak the language of Kansas. And, um, and I think that that is because they're speaking that same language already, but they're viewing the world from perhaps these two separate compartments. Uh, there is a way um, with a little courage and to say, I need to lead in this space um, to bring a little intersection of these conversations together in a place as intimidating as walking into an American Legion. If you were a member of the, the, um, the LGBTQ advocacy group, you know, you're going to walk in there and find out like these guys really are about their character and their values and they're on our side and they want an inclusive America that's the reflective of the Americans that volunteer to serve our country. And I really think we could get a lot of mileage out of that if, if that were something that we were to take on. I love that. So I think a lot of times we have a tendency to, you know, kind of like we talked about earlier, you, you aren't the gay general, you're a general, you're a human, you're human above all things. And I think a lot of times we have a tendency to dehumanize people that aren't like us because it makes us feel less challenged. And I think a lot of the things that we have issues with, with other people, um, you know, the polarization that we have in, in um, you know, the political polarization that we're dealing with, with today, that just seems to get worse and worse. It seems like the more information we have, the more people close up because they, you know, they don't like being challenged. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I think that it's incredible that, you know, that we can have this conversation here, that we can talk about this stuff. But the number one thing I think to take away from all this is that we're humans first. We're humans first. And, and all this other stuff is just, is just, just, you know, colors and details on the painting. Um, but I, I do, for my question though, I do kind of want to step away from this because I don't want you to think that we're only here to talk about this. I, you know, you've had this incredible trailblazing career in the army, um, you know, all these zigs and zags, um, but everybody needs a break. You know, can you share a hobby or an activity that you and your wife enjoy together to unwind or stay connected amidst your demanding schedules? And not to say you can't comment on what I said, if you, if you had something to comment, I just... You know, I do want to step away from that same conversation for a yeah. second, if you want. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Just a, the last comment on on um, that amazing statement that, that you made there about the people is that, you know, sometimes we hold these stereotypes because we have never actually met someone who is othered. Yes. I mean, even when I met my wife, Tracy, she she had never met anybody in the army before. And, and so I think that some of these opportunities to have these cross conversations and these intersectional conversations between organizations, you've got the formality of the two organizations came together. It's a formal conversation. It's not going to happen spontaneously at the car wash where you have to feel afraid, um, but that, um, that we can have these conversations and then you can replace that stereotype um, with a real person. Um, and you then have that to reflect on and then to bring up in the next conversation. It's like, I used to think that way too, but you know, then I'm, then I met General Smith and um, yeah. she was just like regular, you know, <laughs> so, the, you know, those sort of things. Um, sure. But, you know, I, when... I agree. I think the, be <laughs> the biggest way to fix racism or, or issues with religion and things like that is to just meet someone who, who, who really knows their stuff and can have a conversation in a non-threatening way, because obviously you've got the the present, you could sit down and just dominate somebody in a conversation if you wanted to, but that doesn't make someone learn something. That doesn't make you human to them. You've got to, you've got to show them that, that, that regular, <laughs> she's just regular. Yeah. They, they, regular. They, just regular. In, in uh, Korea, uh, I had a driver, um, he was, Mr. Han was wonderful. And um, on my way leaving, um, before I left the country, we, we had a, like a team dinner, like, you know, everybody in the military does, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The, um, and he was talking about, cause um, Tracy and I were there and he he just came to adore Tracy. And, and he told us that, that in that conversation, he goes, you know, he goes, I'm a Christian. He goes, and I was really worried about what to expect. Um, you know, I, I didn't have any idea what to expect. And I was really worried 
um, you know, when I came to drive for you, he goes, but, and then that's where he taught me to say that he goes, you and Tracy are just regular. And, um, <laughs> yeah. And so that's, uh, that's where, thank you, Mr. Hong for, you know, letting me think about it, uh, in that way. But Tracy is awesome. I got to tell you. So to jump to that, uh, like, what do we do again? We just relocated. So we're kind of setting up what we hope is going to be our retirement community, learning to find our way to the beach and do a few things like that. And um, so yeah. we enjoy this transition has been fun, even though it has all the things that go with moving that are no fun. Uh, but, you know, if we had to pick like really what we do, we like to travel. Mm. We like to see different things in the world and experience different cultures and talk to people who are different than us. And uh, it's just something that we really, really enjoy doing. Awesome. Thank you. Well, so much. On that, yeah. On that same, same vein, sort of not off topic, because all of it's important, <laughs> but um, you know, some of the most critical years for veterans are during that transition period. And as you know, our community has um, been suffering from a, a high rate of suicide. And a lot of that is during those critical years post-service. And so I'm curious, Curious, what are you doing to keep your mental health up? How has transition been? Um, what's been like the craziest, most unexpected thing uh, <laughs> in the ensuing years since you retired three years ago? So what's it been like? Yeah, it's, um, you know, the first thing that you notice when you retire is first thing I noticed, just like nobody cares where you are anymore. And, um, and that was weird because, you know, it was like a hundred percent accountability 24 seven. And it's like, and then just one day, no one cares anymore. And so that was kind of weird. Um, you know, it's like, well, I think I'll just go to the store now, you know, it's no one even cares, um, <laughs> that sort of thing. And, um, you know, I got asked a lot, um, one of the policy portfolios I had in the Pentagon, uh, towards the end of my career was the transition assistance program for the Army and the, was part of the working group, the interagency, the joint working group with um, all of the civilian agencies um, working on transition. And, you know, now that I am three years past transition is we have to stop asking active duty folks what transition is like. Yes. And we have to stop keeping active duty folks to be the representative of these programs. <laughs> My goodness. And we we really need. I mean, if you want if if you want a general to go sit in on these interagency meetings, is um, take a retired one who's living through it. You know, keep them up to date on current policy. You know, but but have them take that lived experience uh, into the room because, you know, it it is difficult. You lost your tribe, you lost your language. And, yes. you know, in my case, I, you know, I have the security of, I, I was retirement eligible. My VA experience has been very positive and all of those things. Um, but you, you just sort of like tumble around like a tumbleweed for a while. Um, and, and I made a conscious decision that at least in my first year, I was going to do nothing. I wasn't going to jump right in I didn't have a desire to be a defense contractor. I didn't, I, I thought I was just gonna take a year and be quiet. And that was good for me personally. I think that if I had jumped into another high-speed job, I just would have been coasting on the same adrenaline that I was carrying, um, you know, at the same day that I served. And I was just kicking the can down the road about how do you slow down a little bit and, uh, you know, find that center for yourself and, and just kind of be present with your life. Um, because you're moving at such a high rate of speed just from the nature of military service. And again, I'm preaching to the choir. So on, on this little bit. So yeah, I'm going to go, it's, it's been difficult. What I have done to try and smooth some of those difficulties is that, you know, I've um, just, I finally opened up and went ahead and, you know, asked to talk to a social worker and do a little uh, counseling and that sort of thing and have explored some of that, which is something I certainly wouldn't have been as open or receptive to um, when I was on active duty, let alone even have time to go and, you know, make the appointments and that sort of thing. I think that's helped me a great deal in helping me do that recenter because my character is my character, yeah. whether or not I'm the gay general or whether or not I'm no longer the general and I am out in the community doing the things that, you know, and it's that recentering of realize you're, you are who you are. And now you're who you are in a new place, but nothing fundamentally has changed about you. That scares mm. people sometimes, though. 
I mean, I know for me in my transition, I don't know why your story just now, what you were just talking about, it's got me a little verklempt. But in my instance, I was a, you know, a Navy corpsman with two one Marines, brand new father. I'd never even held my daughter yet when I got hurt. So, and then I get injured. And so now I had to figure out in, in, in a completely different, but also in a similar way, how do I take all these worlds and make them one person? Yeah. And, uh, and it was tough. It and a new world. I mean, and a new dad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, you, you have to find a way your, my support system was incredible. My wife is still here. She's awesome. She barely hits me. Like I got all these kids now, like I got all these really great things going on in my life. And I don't know how people do it without a support system. I don't know how people do it when they have to be closed up or closeted, or I can't imagine the struggle and I'm sure in some ways when, when you got permission, it almost felt like a trap. I'm sure in some ways it had to it because it scared me just knowing the people that I knew and cared about because everybody knew who was who. I mean, it wasn't like there was a big surprise where, you know, all of a sudden somebody comes out, you know, wearing lipstick. Like everybody knows who everybody is. They're just regular people, like you said. And, uh, but that transition of in my life is something that that makes me very sensitive to other people's transitions into civilian life and feeling lost and losing your tribe. And I absolutely commend you on taking that year. But I will say have a backup plan because there's a yeah. hole there. You know, I know you know that. You, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. But as somebody end. who's who's been out since 08, I was very lucky to fall into nonprofit and smart enough to hold on to it for dear life. Yeah, this um the support system too. It it's um you know, I didn't realize how much because we all focus too on the on the veteran, you know, yeah. and the transition programs, everything for the veteran. You know, I failed to anticipate how much it was going to impact Tracy because yeah. she lost her tribe too of the army spouses who were so amazingly welcome. She she loved being a Tracy loved being an out army spouse. And being able to do things with the other spouses. And I fell to anticipate, you know, she lost her tribe too. And um, and really, you know, I could find places to go and people who understood. And and hers was she had a difficult transition, I think, also too, for for losing her connection to them. You know, as part of our move, we have um, moved into one of those 55 and older communities. And, and we think about it like, cause we loved when we finally had the opportunity to live on a military post, we loved it. And this 55 and over community is a lot like living on a military post because everybody's about their same stage in life. They kind of, they've retired from something. We kind of all got the same start place. And so we've kind of got a little foundation to start on to form these new friendships and these new connections. And so I think that that is helping her because she's finding her spouse community again, in a sense, in, in that her neighbors are her friends. Yeah. Um, and for me too, we've got all of these groups and I become involved with the, the veterans and friends group here in the 55 and over community. And, and one of the things I did was part of this intersectional conversation is because we've got the veterans group in the community and we've got the LGBT group. And I said, um, I'm in this episode of the show called After Action in, that's on PBS. And I think it would be a great thing if we brought the two um, clubs together and we could see the episode. And um, it's Pride Month is coming up. And so um, the veteran group, the president, he, um, he pulled up the episode and he watched it. And he, um, he wrote to me, he goes, I didn't expect to cry mm -hmm. watching this episode. And he talked about that he hadn't ever really thought about it before, but he could see the hurt and the moral injury that we had suffered that came out and in, in, in the in the interview. And so that led us to just an exchange that never would have happened um, where I talked a bit about my service to him and he talked about his experience coming home as a Vietnam veteran and the moral injury about how the, the community treated him coming home after that experience. And so, you know, I, I think that support system, it's around us every once in a while, you know, we got to tweak a little something to, to bubble it up and make it evident. Um, but, but I agree with you that I don't know how people do it without some sort of system, even, even if it's a little one. 
And I, I will say that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Joe. I want to take a second before you deflect, Tracy. I meant Stacy about <laughs> you because I don't think I've ever had a safer feeling, better interview than when Stacy's interviewing me. I don't think that there's anybody better at what you do, Stacy. I, I I've never felt more loved and cared for, and more willing to delve into my nonsense than when I'm with you. And you are a once in a generation interviewer, and I I got I. I cannot imagine anybody, you know, taking your place in what you do. So I, I, I wanted to take that moment and, and exactly what, what you said, you know, Tammy, is that when, you know, they didn't expect to cry, but see, Stacy has that ability to, the longer you talk to her, the more she picks up on. And then, and that's about 20 minutes in the, the conversation gets real serious. <laughs> And I have that effect on people. Best. I make I make people cry everywhere I go, Joe. It's not just <laughs> I bring I bring the tears. No, <laughs> thanks, Joe. That was really really thoughtful. But I I will say this: the great equalizer is our military service, right? The veteran community is is that. If you walk up to another veteran, you can just it feels like you have known each other forever because we have that great commonality. Um, and your your wife Tracy is a force. Um, a force for incredible change, a force for good. And she is such an incredible spokesperson, not just for um, the LGBTQ plus community, um, spouses, yeah. but just as a damn nice human being. Yes. And, um, I positively uh, appreciate everything she does and what you do. But um, I would encourage her to become an American Legion Auxiliary member if she's uh -huh. not already that, because I think um, her having her voice and her representation on that side of the house would be incredible. It would be a coup. So, yeah. awesome. and I know you're a Legion member, so <laughs> we could get her to like to the auxiliary. That'd be great. Um, so speaking of which, I want to talk to you a little bit. Um, I know we've taken up a lot of your time, but before we, before we wrap up, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, there was a time and you spoke to it early on in your career that there was the don't ask, don't tell. Of course, prior to that, there were some even more stringent um, restrictions and um, which led to a lot of service members who were serving honorably to be dishonorably discharged or less than honorable. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. I know you you're working hard to educate people about getting those folks uh retroactive honorable discharges. Yeah. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit about that and maybe how the American Legion can help you in that effort? Yeah, that, no, that, thanks for that question. It, you know, that, that whole thing of what, what my veteran here in the community picked up about the moral injury um, just really ripples through the population of individuals who were kicked out of the military for no other reason than being who they were regardless of their stellar performance as a soldier Marine or any of the services. And, um, and so what happens is that when during certain periods before the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, you were kicked out and your discharge papers, your DD-214 actually had in there that you had been kicked out for being a homosexual. And it had the characterization of the discharge, of course, um, sometimes they were honorable, but most often they were not. They were other than honorable or in a, a category that prevented an individual from being able to access things like VA um, health care, home loans, or any of the other programs. But, you know, the one thing is, let's say that having that military experience um, allows some open doors to transition jobs and to, you know, good employment. Um, you, these individuals couldn't take their DD-214 into their interview because of what it said on there. And um, so thousands and thousands of people were damaged in this way in that they had their official paperwork has identified them as a homosexual. And many of them carry shame, even though so many things have changed since then. And a lot of these folks that I'm talking about are at this point now 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, they're getting up in age and, and still have this unresolved thing. But what the services have recognized is 
that and what the Department of Defense has recognized that just being homosexual shouldn't have generated anything other than an honorable discharge. And so there are streamlined ways to apply through your services uh, in order to um, have your discharge papers upgraded. Now, it, it may result in benefits, but what it always will result in is a lessening of the burden that you have been carrying of the shame of feeling like you let your peers down because you got kicked out and you weren't there in the spot anymore. You know, it's the biggest thing is that they, they, when they get kicked out, so many people have expressed to me about how they feel like they let their peers down. And so these programs exist in the services. And so, you know, any help that the American Legion can do to when they are reviewing paperwork or having these conversations or find somebody who is in that situation is to use their power as a VSO to, you know, bridge this conversation and help get them to the information and to the point of entry where they can then do the formal request for an upgrade um, on these papers. You know, I, I say I've met people who have been through this and the shame they carry, it is just absolutely amazing. Um, I, I can't even imagine. And, but the things that they feel like afterwards, it's, again, it's like that day I felt on the day that Don't Ask, Don't Tell was revealed and the weight of the world was off my shoulders as I walked down the street to Dragon Dining Facility, you know? Um, they um, they feel the same thing as the weight of the world has been lifted off of their shoulder and they can finally, you know, wear their veterans hat, their army hat, the Marine hat with pride because they're able to talk about it then. A bit rambly, but. No, that's, that's how I roll. I like ramble. It always, it's always honest. It always comes from the heart. Um, I, I just want to say how much we are humbled and appreciate the time that you've spent with us today, uh, regular Tammy. Um, I, <laughs> but before we sign off, is there anything that you want to share with our alphas that that we didn't discuss? Is there anything that you, uh, you, you want to drop some knowledge on us here? I'm going to drop some knowledge in it, and I'm going to go back to, you know, my unique niche of being the gay general. The um, but just to remind all of you about the power of being an ally, and that is a person who doesn't identify as a member of the LGBTQ community, but who is supportive and inclusive, and doesn't think that anybody should be given a hard time or have barriers just for being who they are. Your voice as an ally is amplified compared to the things that I could maybe say for myself and on my own behalf. And if you are an ally, I encourage you to think of it as a leadership behavior as opposed to just a status. And when you have the opportunity and it makes sense, speak up and correct a stereotype or add information to a conversation in the office that might be going astray and, and um, you know, find somebody that you know in the community and tell them how proud you are of them. Um, but you're very, very powerful as an ally to the community and please use that as a leader. Um, Bigotry shouldn't be easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Tammy, I think you already know this, that um, I, I'm an ally. So if you ever need to, to lean on me for anything, I am your huckleberry, whether at the car wash or anywhere else. <laughs> Thank you, Stacey. But, yeah. And Alphas, if you want to catch Tammy on that my PBS series after action, it is streaming on PBS, Amazon Prime, Apple Plus, um, and you can check your local PBS stations. Her story is incredible. We only touched like the the very tippy top of that iceberg, and underneath there's so much more to her, so much depth. So be sure to tune in. Tammy, where can we find you on social media? Do you have a website or anywhere you want to direct alphas to find you? Um, you know, I'm, I am on uh, Twitter is probably the, the place that I am. Uh, you can find me the easiest. And um, so uh, I, I am on there and, and I do have a Facebook page. And so we'll go website coming. Perfect. Thank you so much for uh, visiting us today. Alpha, stick around for some scuttle booty after the break. Talking about suicide is hard. But the American Legion has joined forces with Columbia University to develop training for those who want to learn more about interacting and responding to veterans who may be in crisis. American Legion, be the one training. In the 90-minute class, you'll learn 
to understand the types of suicidal ideation and four behaviors that indicate imminent risk, how to use the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale to determine at-risk individuals, how to identify risk factors and warning signs, and how to communicate effectively with individuals who may be at risk of hurting themselves. Online and in-person sessions are available. Visit bethone.org slash training to find a session. Learn the skills that'll give you the confidence to talk about suicide and be the one to save just one veteran. Okay, Alphas, we hope you had a great break. Now it's time for some scuttlebutt and I'm gonna kick it off with something called retrograde. Now, I will say this, let me preface. As a military photographer, my pictures had to be reviewed by AOR releasing authorities and classified as either cleared or FOUO or secret or whichever level that clearing authority deemed it. And of course, I had a general sense of what was deemed not for public consumption, um, such as entry control points, troop strengths, special operators, people from the alphabet community, you know, the, the no brainer stuff that I would, I would still capture those things while on operation, but I knew that they would never be released. Well, that's kind of a lie too, but eventually they may get released uh, once enough time span has passed. Like they're still rolling out pictures from Vietnam that were classified 50 years later. So uh, anyway, some of the pictures that I think may not see the light of day may actually see the light of day, but I may not be able to there to see it. Anyway, retrograde, back to the point. Um, it's not just military photographers' work that's scrutinized. In fact, uh, civilian journalists and documentarians, whether photo or video, uh, must also go through the same type of releasing authorities if they are embedded with U.S. troops. Another fact is that any former or active duty military member, and I'm talking to you, Navy SEALs, who author books uh, about military operations, whether fact or fiction, uh, must submit these titles for the PAO to review at the Pentagon. So again, with the same purpose of preventing and mitigating any vital operational information from falling into the wrong hands, thus endangering national security. And retrograde was a topic of discussion written in an article by uh, the Washington Post. Uh, it was brought to me by our super producer, Holly, and because of my background in journalism, she asked me to weigh in. So the story goes, in 2021, the National Geographic documentary team, with the approval and consent by the Department of Defense, uh, went to Afghanistan to film Green Berets and their Afghan national allies to clear mines in the country. When the withdrawal happened, the Americans left, leaving the local nationals behind. Shortly after the film dropped, yes, you heard me, the Afghan nationals were filmed. We left them. And then the film dropped, revealing the identities of those who supported our efforts, making in them easy targets for the Taliban, which is indeed what happened. One of those Afghan national allies supporting those soldiers, who also lovingly nicknamed him Justin Bieber, by the way, his face was splashed all over TikTok, including the documentary, which was leased globally. Uh, he was targeted, captured, beaten by the Taliban, and he eventually died of his injuries. And the Washington Post said, in part, Quote, his captors pl uh, plunged his head below water, nearly drowning him. They punched and kicked him. They beat him with wooden sticks. More than two weeks later, his family found him lying in the street outside their home. And within weeks, he was dead. End quote. In case you were wondering, military public affairs officers and the Green Berets both approved the final version of the film before it was, was released, which included the faces, full view of our allies. And for what it's worth, the Afghanis at the time, before we left the country, were reluctant, but eventually granted permission for them to be featured in the film and took part, albeit cautiously. Now that one of our allies was tragically killed by violence, um, the film has since, the documentary has been since taken down by National Geographic and its affiliates, uh, Disney. It's a parent company. Um, and of course, finger pointing has begun. So, you know, National Geographic says, well, we got we got it cleared. Military public affairs said, um, you know, they kind of cautioned against it. And the Green Berets who attended the screening said they warned folks that 
not to show the faces of the Afghanis because they ran the risk of being hurt in the event that the Taliban recognized them. So uh, they were, if they were adamant about releasing the film, why in the hell wouldn't they just blur the faces of our allies who would be at the most risk? Why jeopardize their lives? No Emmy, no documentary, nothing like that is worth putting at somebody's life at risk. And listen, this is coming from a journalist. I believe in the importance of journalism and storytelling, but I also believe in protecting your sources and subjects' lives as well. Journalism is our fourth estate. There is a series of checks and balances, but you have to weigh that against the threat against other people's lives. And for me, of course, it's a tough spot to be in and to make those decisions. I can't imagine it was easy for anybody, whether they were the documentarians or the people doing the reviewing, finding out that one of our allies was killed by violence in such a way is sadden saddening. I mean, reprehensible. And it's almost like a too little, too late at this point that the film's been pulled. I get the gesture, but that should have been something that was deeply considered even more, I guess, than what was already considered, which I'm told was extensive. But anyway, fellas, I'm curious, as non-journalist, how do you feel? There's no world where I can imagine that somebody didn't bring up this danger and it was ignored. That's what I want to know. I want to know who heard... Because if, if, if you could have asked me as somebody who isn't in, you know, the OPSEC community, isn't in like special for anything like that, even I know that you don't reveal anything that you don't have to, even in a documentary, unless those people are completely immune to danger for some reason, whether they've, you know, moved out of the country. And even then, it seems like a dumb, pointless, narcissistic thing to 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 do is to to want to do this in a certain way regardless of there's no way that they didn't know that there could be ramifications yeah uh, i agree uh i mean there's there's really no excuse for this when i was in seer school uh part of the was was digital training about our our presence online and there were opportunities for them to take like somebody's facebook profile and and you know manipulate that and, and use it against them so early on like i was so conditioned to not share any photograph of myself mm -hmm. online anything about the mission or things that we were doing so something like uh in country working with you know foreign nationals um these control measures are in place you know for a reason and it's hard to think like you guys that that um, the people working on these um, didn't know about it. And so then it becomes a discussion of, you know, how valuable is this content? You know, is it worth individuals' lives? And uh, yeah, I just hope that um, we can learn from this and uh, not put people's lives in, in jeopardy um, that don't need to be. Yeah, I guess this is a cautionary tale, everybody who's listening. Um, and, and frankly, I appreciate, I appreciate documentarians' efforts. You know, a lot of those guys, they go out, mm -hmm. guys and gals, and guys, I mean gender neutral guys, but um, they go out and they put their lives at risk to bring the stories that we wouldn't normally get to our home so that we can be conscious of the world around us and the things, good and bad, that are happening. And I get it. And so I will always uphold um, and defend journalists um, and our right to tell these stories and our need and our mission to do that. It's important. But I will always, always keep in mind the security and safety of those around me as well. And I, and I hope um, that, that this lesson, we cannot get this life back of this, this hero. What we can do now is try and make better decisions moving forward and take this as a learning um a learning lesson. But I will say this, they are working to get the rest of the Afghanis who were identified in the film out of, out of country in whatever way they can. And so if you are in the position to maybe contact your Senator or your, your American Legion post can write letters, let's help them get these Afghanis who helped us out of country and, and home to the U S safely and help protect those um, before it's too late. Adam, what you got? 
18 year old Hugo Booth got more than he expected when he bought a combat helmet from a charity shop auction on the British Channel Island of Guernsey. Graffiti on the helmet, insert reads R U P P on the front, and on the back, the words Vote Nixon are written around a classic 1960s peace symbol. Nixon was running for the 1969 presidential election around the same time Rupp was in the military. Nixon vowed that if elected, he would bring American service members home. PFC J Jeffrey David Rupp was drafted in June 1968, went to basic training, and was deployed to Vietnam on Thanksgiving Day. In early 1969, the 101st Airborne was involved in patrols around the demilitarized zone. And on January 15th, PFC Rupp stepped on a landmine just 46 days into his 12-month tour of duty. He survived the initial blast but died before the hospital ship USS Repose on Friday, January 17th, 1969. Hugo said, after researching the graffiti, I think it's only fair to return the helmet to Rupp's family in Wisconsin. And I'm now in contact with Jeffrey Rupp's sister, Christine, who really wants her brother's helmet back. Hugo, who is planning a visit to the U.S. to bring the helmet to Rupp's sister, said, To me, if items or memorabilia have connections to the people who are still living, it has been personalized in some way, it should be returned to the family. They are the rightful owners, after all. So what do you guys think? Have you ever found any military memorabilia in a thrift shop or an antique store? Yeah. And if so, have you been inclined to return it? Um, I personally, whenever I walk through antique shops and I see military stuff, I kind of get, I, I kind of get, uh, maybe a little anxious around it because you never know where they were and in what context. And yeah. so I, I know I have an antique bayonet. I don't know what the backstory is. Maybe it never left, you know, somebody's field bag or whatever, but Maybe it saw some really nasty stuff and that's just got bad juju. I don't know. But I, I do think that people who trade in military memor memorabilia have to keep in mind that there are these instances like this where who knows how they, they got a hold of it. Maybe it was barter traded and et cetera, but maybe it was belonged to somebody who is no longer with us, who needs to send it to their family for a healing. You know what I mean? I think it also matters how it became memorabilia, you know, how it was lost, if the veteran themselves sold it or whether, you know, all these things sort of tie in. I think for me personally, if I, as long as I could get back most of what I put into something and it was going to someone who was going to appreciate it, who wasn't just, oh, you have that and it's worth money now, I want it. You know, in a situation where I think you have memorabilia where the family wants it, I feel like on my end, as long as I could get back what I put into it, or at least close, I would be fine. I would understand because I would like my family to be able to do the same. And I feel like you should always treat others things and, and others the way that you would hope that you and yours would be treated as well. So, you know, in the, in the spirit of hoping that if, you know, something of mine um, did end up as memorabilia that my family would have access to getting that back some way. I mean, I, I, it's kind of a bittersweet thing, but again, you know, how did it become, you know, how did it end up in the pawn shop? Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, so, so like you see these, um, you know, when somebody passes away, they have estate sales and things like that. Like what if it's a world war II veteran and, and their uniform mm -hmm. that they wore in the European theater somehow ends up in an estate sale. Nobody really knows what it is, but then it's bartered and traded, but that, that uniform meant something to somebody. It means something to somebody. I don't know. It, to me, I just, I, I tend to steer clear of putting my hands on military memorabilia like that kind of freaks yeah, me Yeah. I think out. you guys bring up some good points. I don't, I don't think there's an easy answer, but I, I think like what we're all saying is that um, those things, you know, mean things uh, to people and especially when they're, uh, like personally branded, which was, you know, the case with uh, this helmet for the individual. And uh, I think it speaks a lot, you know, to the spirit of folks that do come across this and want to to make that effort to try and return that. 
you know, we've talked with, um, you know, the defense director for the POWMIA uh, accounting agency and what it means to those families when they find the remains of a POW or MIA. So, I mean, to a lesser degree, if you're if you're finding a piece of memorabilia for that loved one, you know, for, for the case like my grandfather, who I never knew um, that served in Korea, if somebody were to return me something with his name on it, that would that would be memorable as as, you know, um, generic as the item, you know, may be. So I don't I don't think there's a, an easy answer. I think, you know, proceed with uh, respect and honor and uh, doing right for others. And, and you can't go wrong. And alphas, if you have a good story about memorabilia uh, coming into it or, or returning it to someone, yeah, we, we'd love to hear about it and how you navigated that and, and what it did for the other individuals. So if you would, post that on Legion Town and maybe we'll share it on a future episode. So leave it to the Marines to take down PowerPoint. They'll attack anything. These guys are wild. <laughs> so the course changing the way Marines learn and how their instructors teach so that includes getting rid of death by PowerPoint, which I feel like is hazing. <laughs> yes. They're like, you can't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. Let's oh put my, on this 20, 20 slide PowerPoint. Ugh. Yeah, when, you, when you've got 30 Marines in a room and 10 of them are at parade rest in the back of the room, <laughs> the problem, they, they always do the worst classes on like uniform regulations or something like that right after lunch and you know they're gonna have like manicotti or something so it just sitting heavy you just <laughs> you're, you're ready you're ready for naps you know yeah. you gotta you snack on a couple of crayons so that includes getting rid of uh the power death by powerpoint and sage on the stage the marine corps is ditching them in favor of what it calls um outcome outcomes based learning so the initiative project triumph, because of course, Marines have to be like victory, <laughs> um, has been in the work for years. It means the service will focus on individual Marines ability to learn rather than cramming instructions into their head, whether they understand it or not. Oh God, Joe, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But as you're describing this, I'm picturing a room full of Marines popping open a pop-up book for like the kind we had in elementary school. And they're, <laughs> they're scratch. <laughs> scratch and sniff, you know, really interactive. I love it. I love my Marines and, and they're, they're, they're simple creatures. Um, no, I say that with love. No, my Marines are fantastic. Um, but, you know, the joke is there because of that aggression. That's why we, we take a learning initiative and, and call it triumph. So, but instead of teaching them what to think, we're teaching them how to think. So uh, Colonel Carl Arbogast, the Director of Policy and Standards for the Training and Education Command. And then <clears throat> the process, we're making them better decision makers or adaptable, and we're able to deal with changing and challenging environments depending on the job that they've been asked to do. So outcomes-based learning has been part of the American education system for decades. According to the Department of Education, the learning method focuses on the end state for the student, which they can demonstrate the result of their education, which is just practical application for learning. And, and I think that we've established truthfully, all joking aside, it works better for everybody, not just Marines, because, you know, as much as I'm poking fun, Marines are just people. They're yeah. just people that like to shoot stuff and throw grenades. And so they're just, they're just people that didn't make it in the Air Force. So. Hey, look, ASVABs are hard. Okay. <laughs> no, um, well, I mean, I, I learned by I learn by doing things. I can't necessarily read something and be like, I've got it. Let me go do this. And I, I just, it's not an effective way of learning for me. So this makes sense. Well, you know, even as a uh, corpsman, I, I, you know, you can learn the names of all the things that you're going to learn how to do when you get into war. I mean, you know, there's nothing like we just did a training thing. And when it really locked in how to wrap somebody's ankle up after a bad fall or after an injury was when somebody fell off a building you know, the top of a little one story balcony thing. And, and I ended up wrapping up his ankle. I can read about that a thousand times, but until I do it, it means nothing. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I think this is fantastic. So Jeff Bezos had a thing at Amazon where they didn't allow um, PowerPoint at all in like management and executive meetings. And what you had to do is um, like in memo format, be able to articulate like your position or whatever your update was in, in meeting and um, you had to circulate that prior to the meeting, which made that you had to have a certain level of preparation and preparedness. 
and uh, and and also, you know, command of what you wanted to um, communicate and express to folks, then everybody was required to have an uh, read it prior to the meeting, and then a discussion could ensue that was action oriented and solution oriented. So that's less out of like you know the the training side of the equation that you guys are talking about, but yeah. kind of more on the managerial uh, uh, executive side because we can also use it as you know, a default crutch, um, to be able to fall back on. And, you know, in a lot of these trainings, you know, they have the same PowerPoint that's recycled from, you know, person to person 20, 30 years ago with like, yeah, yeah. And then you got to go to a, a day of training and you're in those like one after the other and you zone out, you can't take it. You can't take in that much information. So, you know, there's better ways to do it, to absorb and, and retain, to engage and discuss, and then be exposed to it repetitiously to be able to form um, new patterns of, of behavior. So and out with PowerPoint, leaning, Microsoft, take that, Bill Gates. You're leaning into the strengths of Marines and, and you know, our infantry, our American infantry anyway, they're flexible. They can do anything, you know, and when you, when you do that sort of, when you focus that training on that individual, you're, you're empowering that individual. You know, we were having a pre-discussion earlier talking about, you know, small unit leadership. And one reason why our American military is so effective is because there's, there's always somebody that is trained and ready to step up. And yeah. the more prepared these people are, there's always at least one fire team leader in every squad that can do the job of that squad leader, which it keeps the squad leader on mm -hmm. his toes because there's always somebody that, that can do what he does. You know, there's, there's no uh, knowledge um, stone walls where you're like, you don't know how to do these things. So I'm in charge. There's none of that. It, it all comes down to who's the best for the job. Yeah. I mean, did you guys ever have that sort of um, training where it's the one up, one down? So you know the job of the person above you and you train the person yeah. below you? Yeah. I think that's that's to kind of like the effectiveness of why our our military is so strong too is, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're not, you're not, a, what is it? You're expendable or you're not expendable, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, just, but you're dependable. But you're dependable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great story. And Marines, you know, I love you. I'm, you know, I'm poking phone at you, but uh, you guys are the best. And you have the the, the most awesomest, the bestest uniform, Barnett. Just yeah, there. I agree. And when those manuals are pop up, they are easier for everyone. It is and, 3D. I, and I do enjoy them. Yes. Yeah. Your pop up books that's are the best. Right. Save, save some purple crayons for us. Okay. So All right, Alphas. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to our podcast, our newsletter, or send us some mail. Hey, if you've got guest recommendations, do that too. You can do it all at legion.org backslash Tango Alpha Lima. We will see you next week. Theme song. See you next week. Hey, I think I like